40. How is uh, everybody's Friday morning doing today? <clears throat> yeah, let me find my clicker here. So uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, let me get organized here. Uh, how many uh, how many people this is a is this their first time at social media breakfast? All right. And uh, uh, what? Uh, sorry, everybody, raise your hands again. I'm, I'm, hey, how are you? What's your name? Dale. Dale, and what brought you out here today? Uh, just the opportunity to learn more about social media. How many Twitter followers do you have? Uh, me personally, uh, only about uh, 375, but as a company, we're up to 28 times or so. What's the company? Winsport. And uh, how does Winsport use uh, social media? Uh, marketing purposes, uh, <coughs> promoting our athletes, uh, those type of things. Cool, and uh, do, you think, do you think athletes should be on Twitter? Of course. And what kind of regulations, uh, holy, this is like a grilling, eh? Uh, what kind of, uh, do you think athletes should be restricted and have um, uh, their policy around what they can say or not say, or should it just kind of be free reign? Oh, you need to keep a rain on them for sure, as we've uh, noticed from some incidents in the past. So. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yes, uh, we should say nice things all the time. Uh, who has under 200 Twitter followers? Under 200 Twitter followers, there. I'm coming over. It's a long place to walk. What's your name? Brianne. What's your Twitter handle, Brianne? I don't have one. Oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Not only is it zero. Does anybody have a Twitter account that has under 200 followers? We're, we're moving up to the front here. What's your name, fine, sir? Uh, my name is Justin. Justin, and what do you do? Uh, I work for Astro Media. Oh, sweet. Doing what? Uh, most production engineering. What's your Twitter handle? It's as Vito J. Except it's protected, so that's why I have it. Oh my goodness. This <laughs> we're a whole team here. He's tweeting nuclear codes. <laughs> well, you know what? Let's uh, let's move on. This experiment is not working out in the slightest. Uh, uh, Social Media Breakfast, for a lot of you that are new here, uh, is, uh, is all about uh, bringing together people in the social media, digital media industry, and uh, we're uh, trying to raise the professionalism and the expertise in our industry, especially in Calgary. And we've got a really vibrant digital media and social media community out here. And there's a lot of really cool, experienced people here. And I know there's a lot of people here who don't even have a Twitter account, and that's cool. That's cool. We're not, we're not naming and shaming anybody. Um, so if, uh, if you're interested in, in enhancing your own social media uh, knowledge and expertise, please find people around here to talk to. Uh, all boats rise in a tide. This uh, event is uh, sponsored by Donna McTaggart and of Chaos uh, Accounting and Operational Software, Inc. Uh, Donna, where are you? She's right in the back there. Woo hoo! <laughs> so thanks so much for being the captain uh, on this boat and moving us forward. And uh, as you can see, uh, Chaos is all about uh, implementation of accounting software to uh, small and mid-sized businesses. You can find her on Twitter at Donna MCT. Uh, we've got some past sponsors, which are really cool. Very nice and very, very generous. Uh, we've got some ongoing sponsors. So we've got um, Matrix, who has donated the videos. Am I moving around too much? A little bit. Okay, I'll try and be positioned. Uh, we've got uh, Matrix Video, uh, Sebastian, who is donating the equipment. And then we've got uh, Calgary Video Creation, who is live streaming this event. And uh, so thanks very much for that. Uh, Genome Alberta uh, is uh, helping us with our new website, which is launching sometime soon. Chaos and uh, Market Wired. Anybody do uh, social media press releases? One person, anybody know what a social media press release is? Uh, all right, well, a uh, little, little tidbit from me is that uh, if you're looking to get your information out, especially in this day and age where uh, traditional media and reporters are uh, facing some challenging times if you keep up with post media or any uh, outlets and uh, social media press releases are a great way to get your company information and rich multimedia out to everybody and journalists specifically and create lots of backlinks and, and stuff and they're really inexpensive, a hundred, couple hundred bucks. Market Wire provides all the services. They also do, uh, they also have an amazing monitoring product called Heartbeat. 
So, SMB uh, committee member, my name is Kevin Hayes. You can find me on Twitter at, whoa, whoa, simmer down. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Kevin Hayes CA. We've got uh, Donna McTaggart in the back. Uh, Mike Spear, I don't believe is here. We've got Crystal. Uh, Catherine at the back. Dez. Heather is not here, and Kayla, right here, being our videographer person. So, if you're interested in doing uh, any, uh, being a part of Social Media Breakfast, let me take out my notes, uh, you can talk to any one of us on, on the committee. Um, we are looking, we're always looking for sponsors, and I think we're, we've got sponsorship filled up for the next long while, but if you're interested in sponsoring the Social Media Breakfast, you can you can do it two ways. One is that you can provide a venue here, such as the Sports Hall of Fame is doing. Uh, so you generally need to be able to house about 100 and some odd people and have the ability to have audio and, and such. And then the second type of sponsor we need is a food sponsor. And so that's usually three or 350 bucks donated and you will feed all of us and give us all coffee, which is probably the most important part of our breakfast, besides great content, of course. So, Who's been to the Sports Hall of Fame before? And uh, wow, like three people out of here and two of them are workers here. Um, <laughs> and how many people are sports fanatics? Wow, all those people and you've never been here before. Well, I'm, uh, I don't know what you guys think a Sports Hall of Fame should look like, but uh, you know, some of my perceptions have been that uh, you're gonna go uh, and see a hockey stick on a wall, and maybe uh, some shavings from Lanny McDonald's mustache in a paper bag. And, uh, but as we've all seen today, that's not what this sports museum is about. And uh, uh, this is actually insane. I don't know if you guys have had a chance to check it out, but um, you, can, you can actually row, feel what it's like to row. Um, what's the proper term for the, the boat? Louder. <laughs> Scully? Scully. Sculling. So you can, you know what, uh, we're just going to go on to, you can actually shadow <laughs> box with uh, Lennox Lewis. Uh, has anybody ever got a, a puck to the head from a Calgary Flame? Wow. It, it was an accident. Oh, it was, it was an accident. Yeah. So you can actually have that simulated here without any injury. Uh, there's tons of really cool corporate uh, team building stuff you can do here. And I'm going to let Mario, who is the uh, CEO of um, the Hall of Fame, talk a little bit about this. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. It's great to, to be able to host your uh, your social media breakfast, and uh, thanks as well to uh, to Donna for organizing the event. Uh, we're very pleased to have your group here and, and host you today. Uh, our building here is uh, the first national museum out of Ontario. It uh, opened July 1st, 2011, after over uh, more than 50 years in Toronto. So we're very proud to have this, uh, this national institution in, um, in Alberta and in Calgary. Uh, it's an international award-winning facility. Uh, 40,000 square feet uh, makes it uh, the largest Hall of Fame in the country. And uh, the state of art uh, technology that uh, you've seen and hopefully we'll be able to continue to explore sets it apart from that typical uh, museum um, where we get that image of the hockey stick or I never did think of the mustache clippings, but... Uh, <laughs> But basically, really what we're here for is not so much even about sport, as surprising as that may sound. Sport is certainly our context, and we're here to recognize the greatest Canadian athletes and sport builders the country has. But really, our uh, purpose for being here is to share stories to inspire. As a charitable organization, that's our mission. And that's why this building is set up the way it's set up, is it is more than looking at artifacts under glass. It's really coming to recognize that the stories of these 529 honored members that are currently in Canada Sports Hall of Fame uh, have done amazing things. So it, it's not so much about the gold medals or the trophies or the track records. It's about what they as human beings had to learn and overcome in that journey that provides the best and most rich learning experience, uh, not just for children in schools, which are here um, every day, but also for, for business. If you look at the value chain of these stories and you dig deeper, you see some of the iconic words like teamwork and dedication and perseverance and setting goals. 
Well, those values are obviously very important for, for everyone, but particularly for business. So what we uh, specialize in is creating custom experiences here in the hall where we can bring the stories of the honored members that are attached to whatever corporate theme or agenda you might have so that we can really use the story as a library of living lessons. We certainly do hope you can uh, uh, explore the hall after the formal part of your program. Uh, in this theater at around 10.30, and we'll make an announcement, we'll screen a very short 10-minute film uh, that's very moving and very inspiring uh, that really helps paint the picture really clearly about what we mean when you look at the stories of these amazing, amazing athletes. So we hope that after your formal program and you have some time to visit the hall, I think there's a fun uh, scavenger hunt of sorts that uh, you will make the time to come and just watch the short film. So thanks so much uh, for being here and, uh, uh, and uh, we hope that you find something that inspires you and of course you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Nobody saw me with my hand up at under 200 and I don't remember my, my, uh, my name, label, whatever it's called. Uh, and that's why uh, people, people like me uh, have the fortunate uh, uh, positions that we have other people that know much more about those kinds of things than we do and we leave it to them. So <laughs> thanks everyone for coming. Thanks so much, Mario. Uh, do, do you have a uh, personal uh, Twitter account? I do. What, what's, what's your personal handle? I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right, we're struggling this morning with the Twitter. <laughs> with the Twitter. All right, uh, so that was really cool. This place is amazing, and uh, as always, I'm going to recommend that we ditch work for the rest of the day and uh, play around in here. Um, so Sports Hall of Fame is sponsoring us for the venue, and uh, oh, geez, Louise. All right, so we've got uh, Socialist, who has uh, sponsored us on uh, all the food that we're eating and the coffee that we're eating. And uh, so Socialist is a social media uh, agency, and what they do is um, manage your social media uh, do community management on social media. They also run Facebook contests and Twitter contests, and they really focus on getting small business and medium business uh, on the digital, uh, on the old interweb and uh, on social media and making sure that it's working for their business. And uh, we've got Callie here. Would you like to say something about uh, social issue? Yeah. Okay, first of all, Kevin Hayes in the bin. Yeah. It's kind of an ongoing thing at Socialish. Uh, our interns all have a crush on him, no big deal, but it's kind of a big deal. Take, take, a, take a long drink of water. Okay. Anyway. Right, yeah. this, this is what Kevin Hayes looks like when he's feeling awkward. You know <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming out today. I'm Callie. I'm a part of Socialish, which is social-ish, not social-ist. Like, the type of politics, but that's why, bonus, our name is fun to say. So we are a social media management agency. We do deal with generally small and medium businesses. We deal with all types of industries, including retail and industry and um, restaurants, that kind of thing. So if you're not sure how to do your social media and you really want to pass it off to somebody who has experience, I've been doing this for five or so years on behalf of businesses, so we do have lots of experience on the team, as well as we have an excellent, excellent relationship with the University of Calgary, the, uh, with SAIT, with Mount Royal University for doing all of our uh, internship programs. So we're happy to provide lots of training for our interns, and I'd like all of our interns and staff to stand up, please, in our staff room social issue. <laughs> Say hello. <laughs> These are real life humans. So we do have a, a staff of 12 or so, is that right Mike, 12-ish yep. right now? And so we do have uh, people managing uh, your social media, so that's Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, We've, um, we're also working on LinkedIn company pages, LinkedIn personal profiles, all sorts of things. So if you're not sure how to manage all of those on behalf of your business, come talk to us. So we are experienced on the engagement side, the communications marketing side, which I love, which is fun and contests and that kind of stuff. But on the other end of things, if you're an ROI person or if you're a data geek and you're like, how does social media affect my business? We have answers for that. And we also do reporting. So if you want to give us, uh, grab us at the end of the day here and ask us about social media, please do. Grab me or grab Mike. Hello, Mike. And we'd be happy to introduce you to Socialish. Otherwise, please enjoy the coffee from Waves. Thank you. Waves, round of applause, please. Waves Coffee all the way up for giving us a really good deal on coffee, and it's delicious. So enjoy the rest of the day, and please uh, 
give it up for our presentation. Thank you. <laughs> kind of a bittersweet thank you, Pally. Uh, that's cool. And uh, check out uh, Socialist's Facebook fan page as well. It's uh, facebook.com slash socialist. They always have really cool um, stuff posting such as uh, the... Well, I think recently they posted Nutella's social media strategy as well as uh, Twitter's uh, new music uh, uh, service that they're trying to get off the ground. So anyway, that's cool. Thanks, Socialish, for uh, feeding us and giving us coffee. And uh, so before we get uh, onto the show here, let's give a big thank you to, um, let's pull out, for those of us that have Twitter and know what our labels or handles are and know how to access our Twitter accounts, <laughs> let's uh, give a big thank you out to Can Sports Hall Socialish Net and uh, Donna MCT for hosting and feeding us at hashtag SMBYYC. So I'll give you a couple of minutes or less than a minute to tweet that out. And if you want to tweet anything today or Instagram anything today uh, or send an email today uh, about this event, uh, use the hashtag SMBYYC. All right, can we move forward? Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is a young man here. Come on, <laughs> come on, step out. Let's give, a, let's give a round of applause for George here, eh? <laughs> More than just good looks, George is the guy that's responsible for making all this uh, technical uh, wizardry work and making sure our mics and uh, displays are all working and uh, he likes the Milky Way. And uh, so thanks, George. Maybe we can all pitch in and get an wash at the end of this. Uh, okay, so let's get on to our presentation. We've got uh, some really cool people coming up here. Uh, so we've got uh, Janet Doyle. Does anybody know JD Trains on Twitter? Or Janet Doyle in real life? Yes. <laughs> and uh, we've got uh, Kara, who have formed a... Um, Sports um, media or organization. Oh, I'm feeling. I'm, I'm starting to sweat here. And uh, and then we've also got uh, Jan uh, Hudek, who's also the 2007 World Championship uh, downhill uh, silver medalist. So we've got quite a power team of people who know about uh, sports marketing and athletes and sponsorship and activation here. So uh, I'll bring welcome. Let's welcome Janet and Kara up here. And uh, where's Jan? Oh. There you are. And uh, well, you guys can control the show from here on in. Okay. So I don't know if uh, everybody looks at the press release and uh, you look at my biography. Um, I went to school for kinesiology as well as law and society, which is a little bit of a weird mix. But my story really starts back when I was seven. So my parents actually homeschooled me, which probably explains a lot for you know, my personality, you know, that sounded a little bit odd. But, um, so my parents told me, so I didn't get the chance to go into, um, you know, phys ed class, like most people did. So I never learned how to play sports. So when I got to high school, I came in grade 10, and everyone already was on the volleyball team for like three years. And so I was like, well, I'm not gonna try for that, I'll look like a fool. So I went through high school, I never played sports. And then once I got to college, uh, my friend was working for the Rogers Center in Toronto. And so she was making a ton of money. And I was like, well, I want to make a ton of money. So I went and applied at the Air Canada Center. That's where the Toronto Maple Leafs play, the Toronto Raptors, the lacrosse team. And so I started working there and I was like, wow, sports are really fun. You get to yell, you get to cheer, you get to drink beer. Like this is Whoa. awesome, right? So I was like, well, I really like the sports thing. So you know what, I think I'm gonna start working at a gym. So I started working at a good life fitness. And because I was there, I started working at with personal trainers. And I was like, wow, I really like this fitness stuff. This is really fun. So then I changed my major from business to kinesiology because I figured, well, you know, it'll always be useful. I'll always have some kind of, you know, knowledge about my body, which will be helpful. So graduated from kinesiology and law and society. A couple years down the road, I'm here in Calgary, and I've never been on a sports team before, ever in my life. I've never tried out for one. I've always thought, you know what, I wish I had, you know, 
but it's just not for me. So last year around this time, I quit my job. I was unhappy, I quit my job, I started talking to people and I was like, I really liked working out, you know, I was really passionate about fitness. So I was like, man, I really wish I could work out at that one sport gym, you know, it'd be super cool to like work out with the athletes and it'd be really awesome. And then like, you know, I'm kind of dreaming and I'm like, well, maybe I'd like make the bobsled team or something. Cause I thought bobsled was like a totally like loser sport, you know, who bobsleds, right? So, you know, a couple months down the road, I was like, you know, I need a fitness goal. So I had heard about the tryouts for bobsled and I was like, I'm gonna email the coach and you know, I'll see what these losers lift. So the coach emailed me, she's like, here's what they lift. And just, you know, it's like a power clean of 90 kilograms, which I don't even know how to power clean yet. And 90 kilograms is a lot of weight. And I was like, whoa, okay, maybe they're not such losers. And she's like, well, you should come be a brakeman on our team. Like, we, you know, we don't, you don't need to lift us. You should just come be a brakeman. And I'm like, a uh, no. Like, I didn't even think about it. I was like, I don't even know what the sport's about. That does not sound fun. Um, I'd watched it in the Olympics before, you know, maybe, but no, that's cool. So a couple weeks later, she said, attention all athletes. And I was like, oh, well, that's not me. I'm not an athlete. And she said, we're having an ice house session, which is, um, I don't know if you guys noticed when you came in, but down the road a little bit, we have Canada's uh, Wind, Windsport Ice House, which is the only facility of its type in North America. So it's a fake bobsled track, basically, where you get to practice your pushes. And so I literally brought my camera because I thought I was going to take pictures of people doing this. And she gave me a helmet and she gave me some spikes. And she's like, okay, push this. And it was in front of everybody else at bobsleds. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so scared. And so I pushed it and I really liked it, even though I sucked. I could tell I sucked. But I was like, this was really fun. I really like pushing this thing. So I did it again and again, and then she says, well, what are you doing tomorrow? Do you want to come down the bobsleigh track? And I was like, uh, yeah, that sounds so fun. So the next day, came, went down the bobsleigh track, and through the first four corners, I yelled woohoo the whole time. I was like, woohoo, because it's kind of like a roller coaster. And then it got faster, and then it got even faster, and then it still got faster. And I was like, um, is this going to stop at any time soon? Because you're at like 120 kilometers an hour. So I get out the bottom, and she's like, are you hooked? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. But I kept on coming back and I joined the bobsleigh team in Alberta, which is probably the, Calgary's probably the only place that you can do it. Um, where you're like, um, people are like, oh, I joined the soccer team. I'm like, yeah, I joined the bobsleigh team. You know, so <laughs> four nights a week, like I just changed my life. Four nights a week, I would go to the bobsleigh track. And then Helen Upperton is one of the silver medalists. Um, for Canada. She won silver in the 2010 Olympics. And she said, I need brakemen for my pilot school. And I was like, uh-huh. And she's like, do you want to be a brakeman? I'm like, uh-huh. Like, wow, an Olympian wants me to be part of her school? That is so cool. So I started sliding with some of the development team. And then a couple months down the road, um, there was an opportunity uh, where Team Ontario was looking for somebody to go to Lake Placid to the North American Cup to compete at like the Olympic training and like stay at the Olympic training center in Lake Placid. And I was like, hey, I've got nothing going on for two weeks. I could, I could go there. And so I went to the Olympic training center in Lake Placid and I got to hang out with all these athletes and like team Jamaica, team, team Brazil. And I was all of a sudden went from no athlete to, oh, I better call myself an athlete because I'm staying at the Olympic training center. So it kind of gives you a background about, um, you know, my history as far as being an athlete. But the really important lesson is that this whole time that I've been learning how to bobsay, I have experienced such a change in myself. Um, I've become more confident. I have become more fearless because, you know, when you crash in a bobsay, you have to get up and go to the top and do it again. And there is nothing in the world that compares to like coming to the bottom and being like, I am still alive. You know, when you rode down on your head for like 120 kilometers an hour. So I'm very passionate about sports. I really think it's great for character development. I think it's good for overcoming fear. And I really believe there's a lot of advertising and media today which makes us feel bad about ourselves, which makes you feel like you have to be a size two or you have to look a certain way. And I don't know if you can see me, but I am not a size two. I have never been a size two. And when I went to bobsleigh, I was like, wow, I fit in. No one else can fit into pants either. This is awesome. <laughs> You know, I felt like I was really like one of the team. And so this is why I'm so passionate about sports and this is why I'm so passionate about athletes sharing their stories because I feel like athletes and like um, I think Marco said, you know, these are all inspirational stories and whether 
you are in sports or you are in art or you are in business, you can all relate to struggling and overcoming something and believing in yourself. So I'm gonna get started if I know how to work this clicker. Okay, so um, like I said, last year I started, I quit my job and then I actually just kind of started studying sports and social media. Um, I started to see a lot of activity, um, especially on Twitter, and there was some activity that wasn't so hot. So I don't know if you remember in the 2012 um, Olympic Games, um, there was a Greece triple jumper who made a tweet that was considered to be a little bit racist, and she actually got kicked off of the Olympic team by her own, like by, by Greece. It wasn't in her, it wasn't in the contract. They had no stipulations about it. They just decided to kick her off. Um, and then in the fall, when the NFL had the replacement refs, the uh, Twitter blew up. I couldn't even sleep. Like I had to wake up in the morning, and I was like, I can't even sleep. This is so awesome. T.J. Lang from you know he plays for I guess the Green Bay Packers or something. He was tweeting, "F it, NFL," and I'm like, really? Did you just say that? And he got 96,000 retweets, and I'm like, this is big. Um, Carrie Price. Um, who plays for the Montreal Canadiens. He uh, received a tweet uh, from, I guess, you know, I call them, people call them trolls, people call them haters, and it says, hey you bum, you face 10 shots and give up two goals. Stevie effing wonder could do a better job. <laughs> to which Carrie Price responded, I'm still your mom's favorite player. <laughs> I think that's a really good one. And actually, there was a poll by the Toronto Sun, um, and I think it was over 70% of people thought that that was an appropriate response. Um, but as you can see, there's different ways that you can respond or you can interact on Twitter. And right here, LaShawn McCoy, he actually had a full-on conversation with the mother of his child. And they were going back and forth like, you don't pay your bills and you suck on that. And I was like, uh, don't do that, bro. Like, that's, that's not cool. Um, prime time, so Antonio there said, you know, we have to have the nastiest food of any team. Don't say that. So there's lots of athletes out there that are you know, um, not thinking before they tweet. So they're kind of speaking out loud. So there's definitely a need for athletes to learn how to use social media responsibly. And that's why Karen and I have created Dynamic Sports Media because you know, we're a little bit educated in social media, but definitely educated in communications and brand identity. And so that's what we set out to do. We saw the opportunity and we are like, we're gonna, we're gonna start to educate athletes on this. So obviously it's very risky business. Um, you've got event regulation, so the International Olympic Committee has a you know, full couple pages of stipulations on what you can or you can't say. So you can't act as a journalist. You, know, you can do it from the first person, or you can you know, start a tweet or blog from the first person, but you can't act as a journalist. You can't overstep the bounds of their media sources. Um, you see lots of team or league suspensions or fines. Um, the NBA actually I think made over $800,000 last year in social media fines. And uh, Mickey Arison, so he's the owner of it in Miami Heat, he was fined $500,000 for telling a disgruntled fan they were barking at the wrong owner, which apparently was breaching the contract of you know, negotiations that were going on with the NBA at the time. Um, I think that's taken quite broadly, but uh, $500,000 is you know, quite a large fine. The British Olympic Council, they warn their athletes against giving competitors a mental edge. So if you know you, you tweet something like, oh, you know, today wasn't really good when I was training, I, you know, I trained like crap. Um, you know, the British Olympic Council is worried about their competitors thinking, oh yeah, I got this guy. You know, he's his training's been going like garbage. So I know I'm definitely gonna beat them. Um, Rebecca Marino, so she was a Canadian tennis player and she suffered from depression, which is kind of separate from the issue, but she used to receive tweets from bookies that were threatening to kill her because she lost a match. They were angry at her because they lost money. And so there's lots of athletes, obviously, like we saw Carrie Price, that receive you know, not so nice messages. So it it's definitely exposes you and you have to be you know, careful about that. Now, um, also, there is the issue of sponsors. So you can, um, so this, this athlete, Bouchard, uh, he tweeted his opinion uh, when Osama bin Laden was killed and Champion dropped him like two days later. He was saying something like, 
oh, you know, I, I'm not really a fan of, you know, a death of any human and God's going to be the judge and champion. Two days later, you know, they're an American brand and they're like, we stand for America and we are dropping you as a sponsor. So that was an unfortunate, uh, you know, a side effect of his, him just stating his personal opinion. But there is a lot of opportunity at the same time. So children rate uh, the most admired people in their lives. Their parents are number one, which is great. I'm sure that parents in here probably think that they're like, what, are you sure? Um, athletes are number two. <laughs> so athletes have a really great opportunity to speak to the audiences that are out there. And people want to hear them. So 68% of their audiences love, like, or are indifferent about sports personalities posting sponsorship messages. And when you think about it, 92% of people actually avoid sponsorship messages. You know, so you're, you're watching TV and a commercial comes on and you go to the fridge, you're like, it's time for a snack. Well, people actually like to hear sponsorship messages from sports personalities. Companies see a 4% revenue increase and sports fans who follow their favorite athletes um, on social media are 55% more likely to purchase the brand if they're mentioned on Twitter. And 83% check social media during the event. So as you can see, I was, um, I didn't actually watch the latest Mayweather fight. I'm a huge Mayweather fan, but I kind of like to watch things on Twitter. So I don't watch it on television. I'll just see what happens on social media. And so there was a live um, update on, I think it was the Bleacher Report. And you can load more posts and then Red Bull is right there saying wings for every taste, you know? So sponsors are getting, are starting to pick up on where people are going. 81% of people use the, the internet for their sports news. I don't have a television. I go to Twitter if anything's happening. So why does this work? Why do we buy into sports personalities tweeting and talking on social media about Nike or a champion? People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. So in your brain, there's your neocortex. It's the what rationale. So it translates language. So you're hearing me talk right now, you're seeing the PowerPoint, you're translating it into the meaning. I'm telling you about the facts and the figures and the benefits, and you're getting that. You're like, okay, that's great. The language part of your brain is lighting up and it's activating. So the limbic brain is a separate part. That's where you have trust, loyalty, and behavior and decision making. You've got no capacity for language. This is where your gut decisions come from. So your decision making and your loyalty and your trust are right beside each other. So when you trust an athlete and they're like, oh, I just bought these new shoes, they're Asics and they really work really well for my running and they made me faster. There, it, there's an immediate connection there, right in your brain. So when an athlete establishes a personal brand, they're making a statement about beliefs and values. They're like, I like to run fast, I believe in this, um, you know, I, I, I believe in family. And so you start to establish that trust and you start to establish that loyalty and you're setting yourself up, you're creating your fan base, and then that fan base is going to, you know, right beside the loyalty and trust, there's their decision making. So there's a great opportunity there for, for brands to align with athletes and then to you know, promote their, their products through the athletes. Um, so Sally Bergson, she's the founder of Wazell, says, I think a lot of the times brands want athletes to be 100% neutral, so they don't run the risk of offending anyone. And definitely we've seen the risk of that. You know, you can offend people by your personal beliefs. But I think that strong personalities are really good. People who are complete drips, who lack personalities, are not interesting to follow, which is so true. This is why like Jersey Shore, you know, those reality TV shows, I'm sorry, I, I used to watch Jersey Shore, but it was like really interesting, you know? They were, they were so crazy and outgoing and I couldn't help but follow them. And you know, people that don't have opinions, that don't stand for anything, they don't have any values, you know, and they're kind of like, oh, I don't have an opinion, you know, I'm not really interested in listening to what they have to say because they don't really have to say that much. Um, and actually I just put their show your wings um, if, you know, Wazelle is very much about female empowerment, they've got uh, a um, activation between Melissa Gayek with their jewelry line and, uh, you know, they've, they've definitely taken a stand and one of the stands that they have and the values that they place um, is in mothers. They're very much behind mothers, which we've also seen Procter & Gamble sponsorship in the Olympics. So the team is the original brand. So humans have a desire for belonging. 
So the easiest way to belong is to put on a Toronto Maple Leafs jersey. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> we're not in Toronto, Calgary Flames. Um, but you share with the struggles and the successes. I mean, if, if anybody remembers over um, a couple months ago, we lost Iggy, he went to the Pens. And people were like, oh man, it was like they lost their brother. I was like, man, I'm so sorry. Everybody was like giving him a hug virtually over Twitter. You know, everyone felt like he was their player. You know, he really stood for the city and he really represented the Calgary Flames and Calgary as a city. And you see fighting to be a common theme in the stories and especially in boxing, like, you know, in UFC, people think violence is what catches attention. And I, I disagree. Dana White says that the reason why UFC is so important is because people love violence. And I don't think so. Um, there's a lot, if you look at like the film industry, there's a lot of stories about fighting, but struggle, you know, and the human spirit overcoming struggles. And this is what you experience as an athlete is you overcome injuries and you have family issues that you overcome. And it's the persistence of a human spirit and people identify with that and they want to connect with that and they want to be inspired. And you can see in the background, these are our Canadian flames in Vancouver, if that was appropriate. So direct messaging, it, uh, it uh, activates the Brokop area and the Wernix area, to, so it gets activated in the brain. The language is decoded into meaning. You already went over that. Storytelling changes the way the brain processes the information. So whenever you hear the story, you want to relate it to your own experience. So, you know, Yan Hudix, a, a gentleman who has experienced a physical injury. I experienced a physical injury and I am so inspired by his story that I am going to be persistent and I'm going to overcome this injury and I'm going to, you know, be inspired by, by his story. And so athletes telling those kind of stories, you know, you look at, I look at Lindsay Vaughn, I'm following her on Twitter and Facebook. She smashed her knee a couple months ago and she's already doing the squats. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I've been on the couch for like a month. Maybe I should go to the gym, you know? The number one sports marketing tactic is behind the curtain. So people want to see the behind the scenes stories. They want that inside peek. And social media has given the opportunity to give people what they want. It's that behind the scenes peek. And it's directly from the athletes. You don't need to have a tele, you don't need to have any kind of broadcasting equipment. You just need to have an iPhone or an Android and snap a picture and be like, hey, I'm in the back, I'm just waiting, you know, to to load up on the bus before the game, and then everybody wants to see that. Um, I don't know if you guys remember last summer, Call Me Maybe by the US Swim Team. It was <laughs> poor production. Like, it, I'm sure it was shot on an iPhone. And it caught 4.4 million views in one week, and it's currently at 11 million views. So it was uploaded right before the Olympics. And then, in, during the Olympics, we saw a 54% increase in teen girls watching the Olympics. Wow, that's huge. They more than doubled the ratings of the number one prime time shows. So all of a sudden you see Ryan Locke on like, you know, YouTube and he's dancing and he's in his swim shorts and then girls are like, hey, I think I want to watch swimming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know what, they're also going mobile. So 68% of people ages 13 to 24 live streamed on a tablet and, or their, and they also were on their smartphones. So you're starting to see that second screen. So I don't know about you, but when I watch, when I go to a, um, a Roughnecks game here in Calgary, I am on my phone the whole time. Because if you tweet to the screen, you can get yourself on the screen. And that's all I wanna do. I don't know what the score is. I just wanna get myself on the screen. And sometimes I actually see Donna there because Donna's a huge Roughnecks fan. And she's uh, usually tweeting there. So I'm gonna go into a couple examples. Um, the UFC is something that, uh, you know, a lot of people, there's people on the fence about it. It's a sport, it's not a sport, it's not a legitimate sport. It's a business model in, in the end. The UFC was $40 million in debt. Um, the arenas were empty and nobody cared about it. And Zaka and Dana White went to Spike TV and they came up with a reality TV show and they paid Spike TV $10 million. Usually broadcasters pay for the TV shows. This was a TV show paying the broadcaster. So they provided in this reality TV show, and we look at you know fighting, and a lot of people are saying, oh, there's just a bunch of guys humping each other on the ground. Because they didn't understand jujitsu. They didn't understand what was going on. They didn't know what it meant to pass the guard. 
So we saw the Ultimate Fighter reality television show, and it taught people about the sport, and they started to appreciate it. And they also saw a storyline behind the fighters. They saw the individual fighters, and they talked about their families, and where they were from, and they saw them training, and they saw their storyline, and all of a sudden, UFC jumps over, you know, and it's the fastest growing sport in the world. It's making tons of money, the logos are everywhere, and people are going, well, where did this sport come from? And I'm going, well, why aren't our Olympic athletes making more money, or, you know, why are our teams struggling to get support? Because you've got a business model here, and they understood how to connect with people. A lot of the, you know, a lot of the MMA communities were already online, and Dana White knew this, and they have gone to Facebook. They live stream the preliminary fights on Facebook. And so you've seen this explosion in the UFC because they've looked at the market and they say, well, how do we get to the people? And how do we educate them? And how do we make people fans of the UFC? Now, HBO, I don't know if anyone's seen 24-7. I'm a huge fan of 24-7. It is a really well-produced television show. So in 2007, they followed this kind of model. So they started coming out with these four-part series that led up to boxing matches. And if you get a chance, please watch them. They're really well executed. And so in 2007, it was the Mayweather, it was a Mayweather fight, and uh, I'm sorry, the name escapes me. It's in the back of my mind. So it was a record 2.4 million pay-per-views, 21% over the last one. That was an additional, um, I think it was 0.7 million pay-per-views. It made a huge leap as far as um, the sales. So you saw people that became interested in the storyline and then they want to see the results. You know, you see Mayweather with his family and he's roller skating with his girls and then he's like in his big boy mansion and he's got his money and he's got his cars and he's like, and they're fighting each other and they're, you know, they're saying things about each other and people want to see the result. They're like, well, what happened? You know, it's like cutting off the end of the movie. You're like, well, what happened at the end? What's the result? So you saw UFC go social. They have undercards on Facebook. They also have a huge bonus program for their social media. So they have a quarterly social media incentive. It's $5,000 per, per um, award per quarter, per quarter. So the most followers, the biggest percentage growth, and the most creative. They also had the UFC hunt. So whenever they had a UFC event in a city, Dana White would say, it's the UFC hunt. I've got a pair of signed gloves. This person is holding them outside the arena. The first person to get there, you know, wins the gloves. So he started this really gamification process on Twitter. Dana White himself, huge personality. I talked a little bit earlier about people <coughs> don't like, you know, people that are drips. And if you ever follow Dana White, he will, he does not care. He will tell off reporters or people that he doesn't like. He's got trolls and he tells them to F off. Like he doesn't care, but people love him. He has got the most followers um, out of any sports regulation body, I think, or he is the commissioner of the commissioner of the UFC. So any commissioner um, in any sports category, and they still, uh, are, you know, they still stand for something. So Nate Diaz, he tweeted a, um, a a slur of some sort, and he was suspended from the UFC. And I was like, that's pretty interesting. You wouldn't think. You think you know the UFC is no holds barred, say whatever you want, but the UFC is like, no, we're not standing for that and you are gonna be suspended. So even the UFC has regulation. So they're doing a great job with their social media. And as you can see, they're exploding everywhere. They're making a ton of money. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, campaigns. It's the Boston Bruins. And in 2009, they came out with an advertising campaign. They had fabulous commercials featuring this bear. And as you can see, this is the Bruins den. So it's everything Boston Bruins in one page. So every fan, if you want to you know, learn, learn about Boston Bruins, you don't need to go to your TV anymore. You know, if you're a huge Bruins fan, you just go online and they have everything right here where you need it. Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, TV, mobile, Pinterest, Google Plus, and they've got Instagram. And it's a great interface and it's everything right there when you need it. They've got the advertisements, they're selling their gear, and they're actually doing a beardathon, grow one for Boston, which is uh, really interesting. It's kind of like you know Movember. Um, and uh, here's their Pinterest page, which I thought was hilarious. So the bear is the host of the Pinterest page, and he has got a uh, 
group of X's, as you can see in the middle pin there. Those are his X's. Um, Megan Fox is apparently one of his ex-girlfriends. He said, after prom, she tells me she wants to be a paralegal. So I says, Megan, you're a decent looking girl. You should be in the movies. Um, and then this is, I think, Donna. And Donna said my, or no, her name's Sandra. Said my back hair bothered her. Well, guess what? Your toenails are disgusting, Sandra. <laughs> and then we get uh, the Boston Bruins team here. They've got 7,369 likes, and this was actually right before the Boston Marathon, so that was their team out and about um, running for the Boston Marathon, and they've got a huge following on Instagram, and they're reaching their fans where they are. The fans are online, and they are reaching their fans, and they're spreading their brand, and they're strengthening the personality of their brand, and people love it. They eat it up. So this is the beard a -thon, which is the new campaign by the Boston Bruins. And it's really a great example of the gamification that you can, um, you know, just, it's so, it's so awesome. You can get so creative with social media and with sports. And you can see you've got the face-off winner of the day. He's raised $1,350. You've got the beard of the day, the top beard growers. And you can sign up and you can grow a beard and you can collect pledges to help Boston. Um, so I kind of mentioned Floyd Mayweather, he uh, is a villain. You know, he very much portrays a villain and people don't like him. I don't care, he does what he does really well. If you do it, you know, if you do it really well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna figure out everything that you do. I've looked at every video, every photo of Floyd Mayweather. So he started boxing when he was a young kid. He had a manager who named him Pretty Boy Floyd. A little while down the line, he fired his manager and he became Money Mayweather. He became a villain. So he was with HBO for a long time and you saw he had the pay-per-view, he set the record for the most pay-per-view buys. He has now moved to Showtime. They actually air all their content online. So HBO does their 24 sevens. They air them on HBO. That's a very specific market. I don't get HBO, I don't have a television, so I don't get anything. But you know, you have to pay a premium to get HBO. So you're only reaching a certain market with that 24 seven. Whereas Showtime airs all their content online. So those all access shows that provide the, the sneak peek leading up to the fight, it's online so you can watch it and then you still wanna see what, what's going on with the fight and so you end up purchasing the fight. Um, and then what's really interesting is with the all access, he used Common as a narrator. So he was really going after a niche market. And then they had a CBS special. Um, and that featured Ice Cube, it featured Kobe Bryant. He has partnered up with 50 Cent and then they had a really big fallout. They were yelling at each other on Twitter. He's aligned with Justin Bieber. He had Justin Bieber bring out a belt in one of his fights. And you'll see in a little bit that uh, Justin Bieber, you know, puts up pictures of uh, Floyd Mayweather and gets a huge, huge amount of likes and gets great impressions and then He's just expanding his network and he's reaching a new audience that he wouldn't get before. So May the 4th, Justin Bieber put up an Instagram photo, 47, sorry, 477,000 likes, 25,000 comments. That's huge, it's, it's huge. So um, the pay-per-view buys for May Day, which was his most recent fight on May the 4th, were down, but he's developing a strong brand with the money team, this whole villainous team that they have. And it's going to lead to greater success. The guy is planning on retire after, retiring after these six fights. So he is just really kind of paving the way for his retirement and building his brand. So you can see some of the things that Floyd Mayweather does online. He tweets his, um, his bets. So he tends to bet a lot. And he, you know, he's, he's a big money guy. So he bets some big money. And then he's sitting in front of all of his cars. You know, he's the money team. And you can see the photo that Justin Bieber has put up, and it's you know it's very much the Floyd Mayweather image. It's in your face. It's villainous, but it got a lot of conversation going. And then he has his products here, so you can be part of the money team. You can be part of that brand. Like you know, you can be part of the team. And he's got his own app, and actually I downloaded his app because I'm a loser like that. But he, one of one of the cool things in his app is it's got push-ups here in the corner, and it takes the iPhone or your Android or whatever. You put it on the ground and you do push-ups and you touch the phone with your nose and it counts the number of push-ups you do and then you can tweet it. And it's like, <laughs> he's completely thinking about the iPhone in a new way and interacting with technology in a new way. 
and he's making it you know relatable to his brand and i thought that was a really cool outside the box uh, you know way to connect with his fans and i guess that, that's it for me so kara this is the thanks everybody and kara's gonna get up and she's gonna talk a little bit about the modern communication model so how do you actually do this how like what are the points that you need to worry about Kira's going to get up and talk about, uh, you know, how to execute your own strategies. Excellent, Janet. That's, um, that's awesome stuff. So you can see one of the reasons why I like working with Janet so much is because she knows her stuff. And she doesn't just understand it from a social or media perspective, but she actually understands the, the dynamics, the science, um, <coughs> the intricacies behind it, how somebody mentioned before the deeps, the return on investment, all that kind of thing. So awesome presentation. Um, okay, so now, whoops, I guess we're going to go forward. <laughs> okay, so for us, the digital athlete, exactly what Janet said, how do we make this happen? It is really dynamic, and you start looking at that kind of stuff, and you think, if I just engage, jump into it at this place, am I going to get my return? Am I we're just spinning my wheels? So how do we go about this? So the big part of what... Um, social media and getting out there and acknowledging and gaining audience is obviously about storytelling. So this um, is, a, is a film. We're going to just do about four minutes here. And it's a short little clip and it's about the bull riders. So it's not, typically you don't think of sports or bull riders as, as athletes, but they completely are athletes and they're engaging in social media and strategy just the same as everyone else. So just a couple minutes and uh, we'll watch the... <laughs> Today we are at the second round of the Canadian Finals Rodeo in Edmonton, the greatest rodeo in the world. I'm Scott Schiffer and I'm a professional bull rider. My theory has always been I try to surround myself with people that are better than me because then you only have one way to go and that's get better or they send you home. I've been an Alton Rodeo basically my whole life, but at a professional level for 15 years. Between rodeos and bull riding and practice bands and that, I've probably, probably been on about 3,000 bulls. I tore my PCL up in my knee, broke my femur on my right leg, broke my fibula and tibia on my left leg. I got a rod through my knee and my hip for this, and I got a rod through my knee to my ankle on this one. Um, tore my bicep off right here at my elbow and it rolled all the way up into my shoulder. They pulled it back down and screwed it together. It's good, it hasn't given me any trouble now. The first time I come here as a professional bull rider, I was 18, just 18. And I've been coming back, you know, I'm 32 now. So, but I'd say that mid 20s is kind of when guys really hit their peak, and then from there it's hard to stay at that level. You you see very few bull riders that are 35 or older, and just the everything else that goes with rodeo and bull riding is what wears you out. It's the drive and the being gone for a while. So that's that's why most guys quit. Everybody likes to rope a little bit different. I like to say that way, my rope holds on to me, I don't have to hold on to it. You gotta keep your hand on the rope to make money, so if it comes out, you don't win any, so I'm trying to make it sticky so it holds on to us. You can't turn your switch on too early or else 
you burn yourself out mentally and physically. Driving the bolt for eight seconds is like same as a 45 minute workout. Most of it's mental. I wouldn't say I'm ever really scared, but you're definitely nervous. You jitters like, I'm scared of losing. I don't want to lose. This is our final. This is our Stanley Cup. This is our Super Bowl. You know, if I could have a bull riding once a week at 10 miles from the house that I could take my family to, I'd probably ride those 50. Get in, get on, and hold on. For a couple of reasons. First of all, um, people when they think about athletes, you know, you're thinking the extreme or belong to the team or whatever. But really, being an athlete does come from inside, and everything about being an athlete is about um, is about your story. So we're gonna go through just a little bit quick. This is obviously a very um, we've come up with communications model to help you achieve what's going on out there. And so we're gonna go through it pretty quickly. Again, one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot of dynamics and a lot of information for each one of these. So the first thing you need to do is, is have brand identification. And I've got up here, it's beyond the pretty colors, but realistically, we all know it's completely all about the colors. <laughs> there's a huge psychology behind colors and you wanna make sure the ones that you pick, they meet your message, they suit your brand. And it's not just, oh, I'm on the red team, so I'm gonna go with the red color. It's about who you are, because your team may change. And it's about something that's gonna be able to evolve with you and move into your future as your career, your abilities, your focuses and your passions change. So the product when you're an athlete, it is your passion. It's not I'm a hockey player. There's tons of hockey players out there. What do you bring as a hockey player? What's behind you? Where do you come from? What's your story? Once you've identified your brand, you want to decide to go with it, bring it on and be bold. Just like what Janet was saying, nobody's interested in following somebody who doesn't have anything to say. So if you believe in your brand, it's about your product and it's about your passions, let people know. Next thing you want to do is once you've identified yourself is you need to integrate. And so there's the top three or the top five and it's always a no brainer, but people consistently ask us, do I really need a website? I have Facebook, I have Twitter, I have a blog spot, whatever. You absolutely need a website. Everything about the future in web, um, um, about internet, is your web is your storefront. So everybody's shopping in your storefront through your website. And beyond that, what they're gonna do is they're gonna go beyond just window shopping and they're actually gonna start purchasing. So every website that we're developing, we're developing with an opportunity for monetization. So there's a buy button no matter what and how. And so Janet kind of mentioned it earlier in the products and we've heard this out of the music industry too, is that we're in the business of selling t-shirts. So if you're an athlete, you wanna get your t-shirts out there so that people can be part of your brand and, and get on your team. Um, another thing about being a branded athlete is everything's about donations. So don't be scared to have a, a donate button up there. It's something that I don't think people really think about when they're looking at individual sites. Um, when we talk about other social medias, there's Pinterest, there's all these kinds of things. And if you wanna bring somebody on to manage those extra auxiliaries, then that's great. But realistically, is, is time is money. And so you wanna make sure that if you're spending your time in your sites, that you're getting a return on investment. So, Spending your time on, on your internet site, excellent. Spending your time on Facebook, excellent. <coughs> Spending your time on Twitter, everybody knows that there's huge engagement and, and massive return on it. Another thing, um, when you're trying to integrate your brand into your societies and specific about athletes, is go where your culture is. So wherever your sport culture, wherever they like to hang out, wherever they're predominantly using their social medias, you wanna be a part of that to engage with. Once you've identified, you've integrated, you have your platforms ready, you want to make sure that you start to curate it. And you can't just go up there and say, hey, be my friend. People aren't going to be interested. So within the curation, once you have everything out there, you want to start providing content. And content is key, and, and people have been speaking it for years, and same thing here. With content, something you want to think about definitely is your visuals and your copy. People don't have time to read a lot of words. And I, I'm a writer, I come from writers, I listen to writers all the time. They want to over explain and over communicate, definitely my style. 
but the reality is the audience doesn't have time for that. So hit them with some, with some quick visuals, add some basic copy that you know, shows your feelings and your, um, um, your thought process behind it, and you move on. Another thing that's really huge about your social curation is your constant engagement. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's, if it's brand new necessary information or if you're sourcing it from somebody else or if you're, it's your industry information, but you need to have constant engagement with your audience or you're gonna lose them. Social syndication. So another thing, you know, you've got the curation, you've got your friends on board, but now when you really wanna take them to the next level. So what you're gonna find is you're gonna have your friends, your followers, and your fanatics. And this is gonna come into different areas. Um, so you know with your, fr your friends, they're right there, they're cheering you on, they're part of what's going on, you can engage them to volunteer. Um, followers, those are more like the wallflowers, they wanna sit in the shadows, they like to be entertained by you. Fanaticals, and I also call them family, um, engage them, ask them to come out, ask them to retweet, to do mentions, and to be a part of your team. And don't be afraid of this. There's this whole concept of parasocial relationships that's coming out, and it's something, it's a new concept, and so as an athlete or somebody who's in social media, you need to realize that people know you. They follow you, they know what you've been doing on a regular, daily basis. They want to engage in it, and they want to be a part of that story. And so if you're putting all that content out there, you need to make sure to understand that those people are a part of your life and they are becoming a part of your, um, part of your family and your everyday, and so have respect for them. Okay, so this is a huge part of it. And about, we touched on it before, and we saw it in the movie, and you can definitely see the impact of something like a short film can do for you um, in storytelling, but storytelling is absolute basis of how to gain an audience or how to gain friends, followers, and fanatics. And an important thing about storytelling, and we touched on it a little bit too, is about your past and about your history, because that gives your audience the opportunity to instantly connect with your experience. When you move your storytelling into your present, into the present, then you have an opportunity where everybody wants to be a part of the energy and wants to engage in it. And then you need to move your storytelling into your future, because everybody's interested in the goals and believing in the dreams, and they also want to be a part of the journey. Um, with storytelling, there's obviously uh, better distributions than others. Again, back to the written copy. Some people really want to get into a book or get into um, you know, a story or an essay and that kind of thing, so have it uh, available for them. But the reality is film, television, and radio, they're instant. Um, they get the message out there, the engagement is instant, and the return on your audience or the attachment factor is, is undeniable. Something that an athlete or in storytelling you want to think about, we always think about storytelling as a finished product, but reality is storytelling is an ongoing process. Um, so as an athlete or somebody in social media, you want to be documenting all the time. And you don't necessarily need to go into it with a pre-thought, but you just want to document because you never know, and it consistently happens with me, and, and you guys probably know this too, but I'll be in a situation, I'll be like, oh, I have this photo, and so I can go back through my photos, I can make a real-time tweak, but I have um, you know, some, uh, some stuff to engage and to give my audience something a little bit extra to, to feedback. So photo, photo journalism and documentation is absolutely key. So document, take as much photos, um, put little snippets, you know, sound bites together as you go along. So blogging and new newsletters is a huge part of being social and about being engaged. And often we just look at it like your website, your Twitter, um, your Facebook. But the reality is you need to have a formulated um, way to access and engage your audience on a regular basis. And so blogging and newsletters is an excellent way to do this. Um, you don't want to over contaminate, I guess some people say, the email box, that kind of thing. But you need to have the regular and consistent messaging. And also with this, um, the importance of databasing. We haven't really talked too much about it, but databasing is absolutely key. Um, in anybody who's trying to influence or have um, an ability on, on world conceptualization. So the importance of databasing. So not only do I want to have a database so I can direct email my newsletters and, and have my, my friends, my followers, my audience right there, 
But I also want to have my database so that when I'm putting information out there, I know what my audience is looking for. Um, when you're going through this process, you find yourself, you're branded, you're identified, you're curated, you start having a nice following, a nice engagement, a nice society or communications, uh, community that you're building, you want to take it to the next level. And now you're ready for a um, little bit more outside the box of the social media, the internal, and you're, you're trying to access general mass media. And so then you need to bring on into media management. And so for media management, you're going to want to start to share your stories and you're going to want to share them often. So again, beyond just the social media, so you're going to want to start taking that to mainstream media. Mainstream media, they get mass amounts of PR every day. And so most of the PR that they get isn't going to get a reaction. So as somebody who's putting PR out there, you don't really need to worry about over processing or putting out too much media because they're more or less not going to pay attention to it unless it already is tying into something that they're already thinking about. But the entire point about that is if you're putting information out to the mainstream media often, they're going to get used to you. They're going to start to see that you have a credible message. They're going to start to see that you are engaged and that your messaging to do with your industry is viable and credible. So if there's anything coming or any events that they're at, they're going to know that you're somebody that they can go to with a sound bite or with information and, and have uh, um, the confidence in, in accessing you. So beyond just thinking that you're going to be getting your stories out and having reaction from mainstream media, the whole point about it is creating relationships. So once you've created the relationships, um, you want to go out there and you want to make sure that you're being public about it. Again, in our day and age and everything, internet and, and um, you know, it, it's all social or, or cerebral, it still needs to be connected and it still needs to be real. And um, so one of the best things to do about this is make sure that you're out in public. There's different ways to do it. You can attach to charities, you can make your own charity. Um, you wanna make sure that if there's celebrations like in your industry or in other industries or in, in offshoot industries that you're a part of it. And again, you wanna make sure that you're approachable. There's this whole thing going on in athletes, although it's, it's settled down a little bit, but initially people were like, I'm not gonna sign your stuff anymore because they're gonna sell it on eBay and it's not worth my efforts. And so a lot of athletes started kind of pulling back from the whole autograph and engaging and there was kind of this glutton and oh, this judgment thing. But the reality is in today's day and age, you need to be approachable. So okay, maybe you don't wanna sign your stuff so that it's being sold on eBay, but you absolutely wanna take photos and you wanna take as many photos as you possibly can because those photos are being retweeted and mentioned and, and engaging audience and they're giving your audience and your fans um, a connective experience which is gonna go forward with you. So at this point in the game, you know, you're credible, you have all your sites, you've gone beyond just social, you're engaged in, in mainstream media, people can see you as credible, um, not only as an athlete, but as somebody in communications and media and, and storytelling and messaging. So at this point, you wanna start going after it and start identifying with products. You know, what suits my brand? Not just, oh, this, this works in hockey because I'm a hockey player, but this is a passion and extreme product, so I'm gonna go after it. Again, you want to go beyond the industry a little bit in your brand matching too. It's not just, you know, if I'm a hockey player, I'm not going to just associate with hockey sticks, but, you know, maybe I'm going to go after, um, you know, summer sports that still represent what I'm doing or, or bringing my message or my brand to the forefront. And then another thing that you can think about once you get into this point where you're credible and, and you're viable is you can start thinking about creating products. And I mean, this has been going on for years. You look at whole, um, you know, Air Jordan and all um, that type of concept. You look at uh, vitamin waters. These all came out of, you know, people who were um, engaged in their industries and they looked for a niche or something that was lacking and they decided to fill it. So the next big thing is something with sponsorship activation. And again, it's all part of the process because if you want to start going out there in the beginning and you're going to be looking for sponsors and you're not even branded or you don't even have your basic sites or you have no credibility or you don't have any followers, nobody's going to be interested in you. But at this point in the game, again, you're extremely credible and you're totally viable. So you want to go after sponsorship activation. 
The sponsorship activation is pretty dynamic and the interesting thing about it is you can kind of make it into whatever you want to. But if we break it down into different areas, we look at endorsements, licensing, and relationships. So endorsements is, is just essentially saying, I'm a real cool guy, I'm gonna hang out, I'm gonna you know, tweet about your stuff, we're gonna get relationships, They're gonna, people are gonna see, audiences gonna see that there's connectivity between our brands and that you know, we get along. Licensing is taking it to the next step. It's saying, you know what, I'm such an amazing brand, I'm gonna share you, I'm gonna share to you, I'm gonna sell to you my license, my ability, my messaging for the next year. You're gonna give me big bucks and whatever your company is doing, you can use my stuff and you can integrate it. So it's not just about me um, being present or about being engaged, but it's actually about my message, it's about my brand and it's about taking it to the next level. And again, with sponsorships and activations, it's all about relationships. Everything that we do is all about relationship building. So whether you're going in and you're specifically going to say, I want to get this out of it, or I'm looking for these kinds of monies, or I'm going to engage with you for this amount of time, the point is you want a decent relationship so that as things evolve and um, the medias and marketing are changing, and as ad agencies and big brands are um, opening their eyes to possibility of engagement, then you have the relationship ready to go. <laughs> okay, so in a modern commu communications model, everything about the future is about gamification. And this is something that millennials have definitely brought to the forefront and, and taken it to the whole next level. So beyond just 15 or 20 years ago, everybody had to have an Xbox. <laughs> so now essentially what happened with that is that an entire generation or even two generations of people have grown up with um, their total nature being about gaming. They're used to spending their entire, um, spending time on it. They're used to having valuable um, relationships and connectivity. It's become a part of their daily conversation. So you absolutely have to engage it. Um, so gamification on any level, um, we can go through like all the specifics, but an important part of the whole point of it is increase the connection and the engagement of your audience. When you're thinking of gamification, the whole point too also is you wanna keep people on your site, you wanna keep people engaged, you wanna build your audience. To, to do that, you can go simple or you can go complex. So again, that's something in the beginning, maybe you just wanna put something simple out there, like a little contest, or maybe in the end, you wanna make it um, extremely complex where people are actually coming out and get to be a part of, of what you're doing. So from gamification, we moved on, we move on into the experience. And from the experience, um, people want to be a part of what you're doing. So you need to share with them, they need to be able to share back with you. You need to have respect for that. Um, you want to create opportunities where your audience can engage with you and can have the experience with you. And you need to participate with them again. So again, it's not just you're standing off as an unapproachable or somebody or your brand has put you over here, but you're actually a human. And in everything you've done through the communications model and through your tweeting and through your parasocial relationships, all of that messaging and all of that branding should absolutely say that you're ready to participate and be a part of what's going on with your audience. <laughs> so in the end, what we've done with your athlete is you know, taking you from from a, a passionate, intelligent, um, talented you know, entity. We've taken you through a communications property and now only are you that talented entity, but now you're credible and you're branded and you have opportunity for the future. So what we've done through this entire process is essentially we've created the ultimate relationship. Ultimate relationship with your friends, your followers, your fanatics ultimate relationships with your industry and with your business and with your opportunity for, um, for advertising and future attachment. So the whole thing about this is about the journey. So you definitely want to engage the journey, you want to share the journey, um, make sure that your audience knows that you're on the journey. When, when your audience or your followers start to see, your friends start to see about this journey, they're going to start to feel it and be passionate about it with you. So in this journey, you can make mistakes, you can have uh, successes, you can have you know, setbacks and progressions, and they're gonna be all a part of that. 
And what that's going to do is it's going to put a position where you're just not this random thing, but it's going to turn you into a credible athlete. And now with a credible athlete and a credible message, you can go out there and you can make sure that um, the brand messaging that you are is definitely a person of character. And when you've gone through the journey and, and you're still a credible stand-up athlete, you have a strong message and people in your audience know that you're a person of character and you have all this stuff behind you and that you can speak equality, then you've gone through and you've created the ultimate relationship. And it's kind of what Janet um, said, she made a little joke about the Toronto Maple Leafs. So exactly, when was the last time they've ever won anything? Like, we, you know, we can talk like this because we're in Calgary. But, but so, but the, my point is, is people still love the Toronto Maple Leafs. They wear their jerseys. They're like, they, you know, the entire like world is like, oh my, did you see that game? And the, the Toronto fans like, and they're for you next year. And so <laughs> when you do this, when you create the ultimate relationship, you can go through the ups and downs and you can still be really credible and you can still go forward. So it's an important, it's an important thing to do. So some of the takeaways we just want to uh, mention about today, and then we're going to get John up here, or Jan up here to, um, to kind of go through his personal experience about being a, a branded athlete. Um, but it is definitely for necessary for organizations or for athletes to start looking at this kind of concept thing from the grassroots level. Um, training and coaching is huge in, in athletes and, and in athleticism. And so just beyond like training and excellence in your sport, social training or media training is something again that just can't be overlooked for the future. And an integrated branding and community strategy, um, communication strategy is absolutely um, essential and definitely a next step for, for anybody who's trying to make themselves credible or, or go from being um, an engaged participant to a star in their industry. Okay. So let's welcome John. Thanks guys for having me, uh, Janet for getting me up here. Uh, kind of to add to the dysfunction we had at the beginning of this meeting with barely any of us being on Twitter or having any followers or anything like that. It's probably the first time I've ever used a clicker too. <laughs> uh, what button do I press? <laughs> uh, just sort of what we touched on, I think, and I. I I've never used a slideshow, A, because I procrastinate and don't prepare my speeches, and B, because I've been fortunate enough to have, kind of like what we were talking about earlier, I've been fortunate enough to have a story, and from that story, my story has a lot of uh, heartache and a lot of, um, what's it called, just a lot of Oh, this is my word here. Struggle. No, a lot of defeat. And, uh, but that's one thing that people cling to, and that's one thing that people can associate with. And uh, as long as you can come out of that, it's a story that people can find refuge in, no matter what situation they're in their life. And, uh, you know, my story is riddled with that kind of stuff. But out of that, there was always light at the end of the tunnel. I always came out of that with uh, support groups and you know, with, with family, with, with friends, with coaches, um, to come out of that into, into success and into victory, which creates your brand and which actually creates the strength of your story. And um, this is how it's supposed to look. Um, I can't actually even do that position normally. Um, I think I have to be going about 100 kilometers an hour to get the G-forces to do that. Uh, I'd probably hurt myself to try and do it right now. Um, but that's, uh, that's me racing at the end of this year. Um, just a little bit about me. I, I was born in the Czech Republic. Um, we immigrated to, to Canada in 87, to Calgary. Shortly after, I, uh, we got an opportunity to come to the Olympics in Calgary in 88, which was probably most of us remember that. Um, not all of us. I say you're wearing a Toronto Blue Jays hat, so. <laughs> I, I wasn't born yet, so. Oh. 
you're really young. Actually, my younger brother was born in 89, a year after as well, in Red Deer, so maybe I'm, oh man, I'm getting old. Uh, I thought we all looked fairly of age to remember the Olympics, but um, that was kind of the first time, you know, like, athletes do, I don't see it, I don't see myself this way, obviously, because sometimes when you're living it, you don't, you don't see it the same way, like, when, when other people are looking in, but when we went to those Olympics in 88, I was already skiing at that time, my dad was a coach, um, you know, I knew that I was going to be a skier, and I knew that's, that's what my life was going to pertain, and uh, we, we show up in 88, we hike up the mountain, I watch a couple of guys go by, and like, I literally watched, I think, one of the Canadian racers go by us. And he didn't win, he wasn't the fastest. I just saw his bright yellow suit that, you know, the Canadian racers were famous for. And almost in a naive way, I, I told myself, this is what I'm gonna do. And it was like a matter of fact. And uh, I think the power of, uh, you know, of, of athletes and, and strong role models and, you know, in our, in our communities is that they have that power. You know, you have your parents as your kind of your first defense for the world, but uh, as, as long as athletes portray a positive, positive message and positive messaging, positive or positive role models and in, interactions and in, in how they get to where they are, um, it's an extremely strong tool to to bring confidence to kids, to bring uh, you know the actual possibility of of dreams and of, of believing things that. You know, maybe even now, if I saw that person go by, I mean, Janet took up bobsleigh last year. Um, I think sometimes the older we get, not that we get jaded, but uh, we definitely, you know, you become, you become more of a realist the older you get. And at a young age, when, when you're kind of, when you're really moldable and, uh, you know, you believe what you're told, especially by adults and, and sports, sports uh, people that you look up to, it goes a long way and it's powerful and that's why coming back to social media you have to be extremely careful and how you portray yourself what the message is your branding um, i know for for adults it's it's funny when a guy swears or whatever else or there's a lot of heated stuff obviously it has its time and place but in general it's there isn't it, it, social media is fairly new still so i think everyone's still learning and there's a lot of boundaries that have maybe haven't been set yet. And I know lots of you know, organizations like Jan was saying have set them, but um, basically I became a skier. That's, that's the beginning of my story. But that enabled me to be on a platform where I could influence a lot of people. And like I said before, from the inside looking in, I mean, I'm going to be 32 this summer. Uh, the shelf life of a downhill skier is 35, 36, 37 if you're really lucky. Um, I don't know if mine will be that long just because I've had a lot of injuries. But I still have heroes. I still have people that I look up to. So sometimes the line between how, how effective you are a communicator and how much influence you have on people around you, you know, the line of who, influ who influences you and how you influence other people is can be fairly close together, it can be even shady area. And, uh, you know, I didn't notice that I was racing against my heroes until I was racing against them. And then all of a sudden I started beating them. And then all of a sudden, kids that were looking up to the guys that I was looking up to the year before are now looking up to me. And uh, you kind of fall into this, and, and sometimes it's, it's, not a, it's not a trained process, but it's something you have to work with. And uh, literally, I don't know if I was the right person to bring to like a social media summit because I've never used one of these. I was against Facebook. I got on Facebook two years ago and like a lot of us, I did a lot of things wrong. Um, I think as we're progressing, there's a lot of rules and, and a lot of formulas that work in social media, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. So two years ago, I finally succumbed to Facebook and went on Facebook. Um, I was like, you know what, I'm not going to use it for my personal stuff, I'll just use it for my, for my skiing. Person's sake. Now I have a personal Facebook account that almost has uh, 5,000 people on it, and it gets cut off at 5,000. 
out of the 5,000, uh, 5, or 4,000, whatever it is, 2,000, 2,000, just over 2,000, I probably feel comfortable to call. I know them personally. Another 1,000 or 1,500 1, are people that I don't really know, but I've just, I, I've used it as a fan page, so basically I did it backwards. Um, I don't know them, but they interact. I know how they're connected to me because they're connected to me through my story or my brand or through skiing, or we share, uh, we share contacts. And there's 500 people on there probably, or maybe 300, that I have no idea how they know me. I'm kind of creeped out by them. <laughs> they send me weird messages. They might be stalkers from Europe. I don't know. <laughs> First mistake. But, uh, you know, that being said, so then obviously I was slow to Twitter and everything else. So Twitter, I ended up going on Twitter uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago. And uh, same thing, like it was like pulling teeth, like someone had to show me that it was a viable form of communication with not only your fans, but uh, potential sponsors, uh, family. And, you know, sometimes they get this idea in their head that, you know, you don't want to put all your personal information out there. And that's, that's true in a lot of ways. Um, but there's a good way to do it um, as we're learning. So when I went on Twitter, I did lots of things wrong. I got lots of followers right away because I had, you know, people like the, the Olympic Committee or CBC, different contacts that would help me gain followers. And obviously once you have a lot of people on Facebook, then they can kind of, you know, jump over to Twitter. Um, for just for instance, like hashtagging. I didn't know what hashtagging was until like eight months ago or 10 months ago. And then I completely inappropriately abused it. Uh, hashtagging like basically just because of, actually because of having four teachers, four hashtag teachers, I'll call them. And they didn't know they were teachers, but they were other tweets that I saw and there'd be a hashtag and some like basically random comment or like three, three words jumbled together with no spaces usually sarcastic, and later I found out hashtagging the actual purpose for it. Now on Twitter, it's become a little bit more obsolete. It's more for Instagram and other things, but you know, hashtagging is a way for other people that maybe have zero connection to you to find you, or to find the theme that you're talking about, to find a brand, um, an idea, a word, anything. And uh, I've actually just been learning that just recently. And uh, so I have a friend of mine that's helping me with this, and the next step was obviously Instagram. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to Instagram. I don't even have time to update my Facebook. I don't have time to do my Twitter. Like, do people actually even care what I'm talking about? Like, you know, sometimes we've got about 2,600 people on Twitter right now, and it's been kind of stagnant for a while. Um, going back to what we talked about before, it's it's extremely important to to know that you need to connect on maybe not necessarily a daily basis, but like you were saying, on some sort of a program so that people know maybe this day or that day, you're gonna put out something, it better be interesting or funny or whatever else that they can reach out to and follow. Um, I broke down, I went on Instagram like four weeks ago and I don't have time to go through all my friends on Twitter and everywhere else to like start following them and figure out what they're doing, and what pictures they're posting. But I started using those, those hashtags properly. And I actually have more followers on Instagram probably that don't know me and probably have nothing to do with skiing because it's a lot of pictures and kind of lifestyle stuff. But I do on all my other, on, on, on my other um, ports of uh, communication just because of using it properly. So I've, I've gone through the process of using Facebook improperly, Twitter improperly, now figuring all that stuff out. But then Instagram, I basically started a fresh note, did it the right way. Now I've got people, you know, follow me from all over the place that just maybe like my pictures or, or whatever else, but find interest in, in the hashtag. Um, I don't even remember what pictures we used, but Janet helped me yesterday get some pictures together, thank you. Um, so I figured I'd just kind of go through like pictures that I've posted and pictures that I've had and then kind of explain pros and cons or you know things, how, how they've let out and how sort of relationships have started from them. Yes. 
this is a panda, obviously. Um, for one reason or another, uh, the panda became my brand. And for a long time, I, was, I knew branding is, is important, obviously. Um, but it's not something that can always be forced. And if it is forced, it can come across as kind of, um, kind of, you know, fake or, or plastic. So probably about three or four years ago, um, I had this like massive, huge white and black helmet that was way too big and uh, had a huge beard. And at the time I was a little bigger than I am now. I wasn't fat, but I was big boned. And, uh, you know, on, on a team, on a, on a sports team, you're like family, you know, the guys, the guys don't hold anything back. And coach is the same thing, you know, you're, you're pretty close. I've been with these guys, skiing with some of these guys for like 15, 18 years. And, uh, you know, so they're, we were in one of the lodges one day and uh, they started making fun of me and you're just like, you know, my coach is, yeah, you're just like a panda. You're big and round and furry. But when you need to, you get the job done. And from there on in, it just kind of stuck. And interestingly enough, um, when you do create a brand, it actually does a lot of work for you. And with this, although it is silly sometimes, um, on my Twitter, I think I have uh, in, in the bio part, um, something to the like of, you know, like I have a seven-year-old son and so, of course, we watch all those awesome movies that probably most of you have seen, like the Pixar ones that are funny for kids, but they're usually probably even more funny for adults. And uh, Kung Fu Panda was one of the ones that we watched, and just his his demeanor, his style, completely fit fit my personality. And you know, he he was thought of as maybe being lazy or you know leaving letting life go by while he didn't really achieve his his true dream or his, uh, his destiny. And, but when it came down to it, that panda kicked ass. So I thought, you know, this is something that I can cling to and this is kind of how my life is, has played out with, with all my trials and you know, all, the, all the uphill battles. But every uphill battle, there's, there's a peak at the end if you do reach it. So this started becoming you know, part of my thing and then it happened before I actually got on Twitter. And this was my number one mistake I made on Twitter. It was probably the first thing you do when you create a Twitter account. I created the most ridiculous Twitter name on earth and it's way too long. So now I have to be extremely concise in what my message is because I don't have space to actually write in a whole thought down. <laughs> so when I started, obviously Yan was taken, then Yan 81 was taken. I think my first name and last name were taken. So I was like, well, why not? Panda, I'm trying to you know, create a brand. Well, Panda was taken. And then I thought, well, Panda House, well, okay. Panda House was taken. So I was like, well, what the heck am I gonna do? Like, all the names are taken. I don't wanna be Jim Swift, 1963-295, just so I can get a name. And uh, I'm also into music, and uh, at the time it was, it was something that was kind of on my radar. So I was like, this will be witty, no one will have this. So I thought of Panda House of Rock, and I spelled house the German way, just to confuse people even more. So, and then I realized, as it was in one word, you couldn't really tell what it said, because all the letters were the same size. So it just looks like 20 letters in a row, no one knows what this is gonna be, it's gonna get all mumble jumbled. So I thought I was being witty. It was a panda in lowercase, house in uppercase, out in lowercase, and rock in uppercase again. So now we have my Twitter handle, Panda House of Rock. People can still find me. Can they find me, as, find me as easily as they can, I don't know, football player Ocho Senka, whose name, I mean, obviously has more fans than I do. Let's be real, but his Twitter handle is his name. So everyone who searches his name, that's the first thing that comes up. Um, same with you know hockey players and things like that. So it's been a struggle, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of created this brand for me, and now when it comes up, everyone knows it's me because it's been the same the whole time. I haven't changed my profile picture the entire time that I've had it. Um, there's a picture of me in Kitzbühel uh, in front of a store that's called Jet Set, 
And I just thought that was really appropriate because that's literally my life. So that being said, branding. And out of that came basically all this, sort of all this like the avalanche of fans or people around now, even on Instagram that basically connect to Panda. So like people will literally, it's obviously in people's heads because people that maybe aren't even connected to me directly or to skiing or whatever else, maybe they follow me, maybe they just see me on Instagram somewhere, but they'll literally, I get like tons and tons of pictures sent to me of like Panda candy, like Panda statues, um, links to the new pandas that are coming to Toronto, um, anything Panda related, uh, people like right away think of me and think of Panda House. So I came about it kind of a really painful long way, but it's, it's turning around and it's, it's actually working really well. Uh, where's the dice? Uh, the picture on the left is kind of a spoof of the breakfast picture. <laughs> Uh, I watched a really funny video actually last night about, uh, there was a spoof, it was, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but, uh, it was a spoof, it was a Nickelback song, but they dub it into, like, all the brutal things that maybe most of us are guilty of doing on, on Twitter and Instagram, taking pictures of food <laughs> and breakfast or girls' fingernails, how beautiful they look after their manicure. Um, so this is kind of half a spoof on that. It's it's a coffee shop that I go to every day. It's right by my house. But at the same time, at the same time, um, branding is a huge thing. And uh, Cafe Rosso is actually where this is. They have beautiful furniture in there. And I'm in there every day. So I just you know was sitting there and I thought, well, I'll just throw in a little bit of branding. And because of the whole panda thing, um, I started a, a charity or a foundation called Panda House. And that's, it's probably a whole nother speech, but just to give you the short, um, I had a lot of, I had a lot of help and a lot of support from sponsors, family, um, coaches growing up in skiing, obviously. And before, two seasons ago, I had the best career of my, my entire life. Um, I had a victory in Chamonix, um, several podiums and was fortunate enough to actually make a living at what I spent my entire life trying to accomplish. Um, the year before that, I had 400 bucks and the team had almost ripped me off. They paid team fees. Um, so basically I had to raise money. People from all over the place came together and uh, you know, I can talk about donations. Uh, some sponsors came together, helped me out and enabled me to have one of the best seasons of my entire career make substantial amount of money in that year and it put me in a position where I knew that I had to somehow you know pay that forward and bring it back around so I started Panda House I already have my brand which is cool so people know I'm associated with the panda um, but I don't want to just call it panda because it's too generic so Panda House can't really see in this picture but the A uh, a good friend of mine Jen designed it so the two A's in the panda are actually eyes of the panda Above the U, there's a little nose, and then the top of the A has a, it's like a mountain with, with ski tracks down it. So it's a neat logo. Um, it's totally catching on. And what I did was it was, it was a brand designed for, for athletes, empowering athletes. And, you know, it's easy for big corporations to, to step up and, and support athletes in our community, especially younger athletes that are struggling or need help to get to, to the point where they can reach their goals. But for me, I thought it was extremely powerful if, if a current athlete that just had, was, was having success in their, in their respective field or sport or career, um, for them to come back while they're still competing and financially support and mentor another athlete that's competing alongside them. Um, it's kind of a crazy idea, um, especially when you're still competing. It's, it's a very, very competitive, uh, very competitive, in, just in the sports world, but obviously in skiing as well. Money is hard to find. Um, so you're trying to make as much money as you can before you have to retire because of bad knees or whatever else. But I just thought it was an extremely powerful idea and uh, I ended up sponsoring 
two athletes this last season, uh, Larissa Yerku, who's I've got a picture of her later on, and Jeffrey Frisch. And they were both kind of just coming up. Jeffrey Frisch was actually paying his own way last year. Same thing, kind of written off. No one thought he was going to come back. And he actually ended up having uh, some of the best results out of, out of any Can Canadian in years on the Europe Cup Tour. Ended up qualifying for our team for next year, so he'll be racing alongside me in this coming season. So it's an idea that I think can, that can work, and that's kind of my brand that I'm moving forward with. So not just Panda, but kind of Panda House. Um, this one I just added because it was funny. Um, I think everyone likes humor, and I think the easiest way to gain an audience is with funny stuff. And uh, this one might just be funny for me, but I was at dinner last night with my son, and uh, of course, our favorite thing to do is draw on, on the napkins and stuff. And we were practicing a spelling last night at dinner. Yeah, deadbeat dad practicing spelling at dinner at Moxie's. And uh, we're practicing spelling, so that was completely unrelated to the picture that he drew. But then I was looking at it, and it was just hilarious because he said he was going to draw a a huddle of penguins and he drew this penguin and it's looking up at the word exercise and it completely struck me because it's exactly how I look at exercise I don't know if you can see that if I have to explain it but it's like I know it's there and I know I need to do it but it's just out of reach so I haven't tweeted that yet but that's going to be the, one of the next ones and it's just you know, simple things like that with a little explanation can go a long way and you reach an audience of more than just in whatever field you're working in. And humor goes across the board. Maybe there's some people that don't like to laugh, but I don't know very many of them. And I'm fairly lighthearted. I mean, that's kind of what has got me through, through all my tough times. Um, but it's, it's a really easy and short, concise way to reach a lot of people and then Obviously, if they enjoy what you wrote, or if they enjoy the same thing you enjoyed, if you're retweeting something, obviously then they're gonna retweet it and they're gonna pass it on, and obviously the ripple can multiply. Uh, this is kind of on the same note, but it goes back to the athlete in Athens. Um, someone sent me this. I didn't find it by myself. I can't take credit for it. It was actually always in some Czech newspaper or something, but I saw that and I thought it was hilarious, the cats. A couple months later, I was in a store, like a costume shop, and I saw this thing, and at first sight, I was like, that's hilarious. But then I read it, and I was like, you know, it, it's, it seems fairly racist. And I was in an Eastern country where obviously they don't view racism probably the same way that we do, and there's just stuff over there that completely passes that shouldn't. And I was looking at it, and I was like, you know, this is definitely a no but there's a lot of people that don't have that filter. And it could have gone both ways, and you know, maybe some people, I don't know, think it's funny, but it, it really isn't. That's funny. Cats don't really uh, hurt anyone's feelings, but obviously racism or things that happen with that athlete uh, from, from Athens def definitely do. Um, have a filter. You're your own filter. You need to be your own judge of what's appropriate to post and what isn't. And at the end of the day, whatever you post online is basically there forever. Um, this is one of the perks of traveling the world and meeting interesting people. Um, being told I need to go a little faster, but Blue Goose is my sponsor. Uh, one of my, my head year sponsor, they do organic beef and organic proteins. Um, Lamborghini is not my sponsor, but a very good friend of mine that I met uh, two years ago in Kitzbühel had this car and uh, he said, you know, I'm trying to sell it, but I can't. It's winter, it's got winter tires on it, it's got insurance, no one's buying right now. Do you want to use it for the season? And I thought about it for about three tenths of a second and uh, said, sure, sign me up. So I actually got to drive a Lamborghini around Europe from uh, December until March this year. Um, all I paid for was gas, which was probably enough, which, which probably, probably ended up being more than like renting a car, but it was worth it. 
Um, but it was like, I just thought it was a really cool way to, to brand myself and to bring attention to, to whatever audience I wanted to reach and I thought that was a witty way of, of posting it. On the front of the car, you can't see this picture, but I actually branded Panda House and then just my ski sponsors and things like that. So it caught people's attention that there was a Lamborghini driving around with stickers all over it. So it's already causing, you know, creating attention because you're driving around the winter, then it's covered in decals. So it was actually, it was actually pretty cool. I did a couple of photo shoots and stuff like that. Um, this is Larissa. Um, this is her racing in Lake Louise. So it was just amazing to have her um, represent the brand and I helped her, um, I sponsored her helmet and then helped her with negotiating contracts and things like that. Things that, you know, athletes kind of have to learn on their own, unfortunately, for the most part, because Canada is kind of a tough, tough crowd to break into as far as, a, as a corporate sponsorship and things like that go. And then this picture on the left, just to tie in everything with with Twitter and followers and building relationships. I built a relationship with Harley about, Harley Davidson about well, four or five years ago. And already at that time, they, they showed interest in kind of becoming involved, but nothing really came to the table. And you know, I didn't want to push it and didn't want to be like, hey, sponsor me, I like motorbikes. But they knew that I like motorbikes. They knew that I ride. Um, I ended up building just a very strong personal relationship with, with their executives, with, uh, with one of the daughters of, of the owner of the company. She's into riding and skiing as well, so she'd come to Calgary and then we'd go on rides together with some of our mutual, mutual friends. And I just never pushed it, and, uh, but it was always on the radar. We just kept building the, building the relationship. And then uh, last week, um, I was in, Toronto, or in, in Vancouver, and they flew out to meet me there and we ended up going on a ride and I signed a deal with Harley Davidson after four years. And just basically, there, it was always on their radar. They were always thinking about it, but now with, with Twitter and them getting on social media, I can't tell you the details, but it's gonna be super cool. If, there's actually one cool thing that they're doing right now in Alberta. There's a guy that they basically uh, hired on to, to ride a bike all around Alberta. It's called, uh, he hashtag, uh, first time Harley and it's following this guy that's basically it's like a first time Harley rider and he just goes and gets on a bike and they follow him all around Alberta like you know he does different people people can actually tweet in so involving the fans involving people that are following they can tweet in and give him challenges and his video I posted two of his videos on my Facebook yesterday so it's really funny um, it's fun to watch it's fun to follow and so we're gonna do something along those lines with them as well. And then I took this picture when we were in Vancouver in front of the Fairmont waterfront. And literally like two minutes later, Fairmont was like all over my Instagram, all over my Twitter. So, you know, if you like-minded brands as well, um, that's one thing I found that works really well is connecting like-minded brands together because whether or not those brands officially want to be together or not, Strong brands beget strong brands, and uh, strong brands are able to, you know, kind of piggyback off each other and get more interest and more retweets and things like that. And that's it. Thank you very much. That was my last slide. Be careful how you remember. You can look really cool, or you can look very not cool. Be careful how you smell for the camera. Thank you very much. That was fantastic, man. Thanks for speaking, and thanks to all of our speakers uh, today. That was uh, awesome. So uh, thanks for hanging in there, too. I know we went a little bit of a, a past schedule. And uh, so uh, I'll, you guys can get out of here really quick. I just want to give something away, if you're all right with that. It's a, uh, has anybody ever been to, uh, oh, the main dish? Fantastic uh, chickpea salad, if you haven't been. Lots of uh, organic and food and it's delicious. Um, so I got $30 to give away to somebody in the audience. And uh, uh, how are we going to give this away? Anybody have any ideas? Just give it to Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be on Twitter. Twitter uh, uh, no. Or, yes, we could do a Twitter contest. However, uh, what I think is um, uh, uh, who thinks they have the most Twitter followers here in Calgary? Who has over 2,000 Twitter followers? 
Who has over 5,000 Twitter followers? Who has over 4,000 Twitter followers? Wait, how many Twitter followers do you have? Okay, 5,100. Who has less than 100 Twitter followers that is on Twitter? You? And you? How many Twitter followers do you have? 27 double digits, we're rocking it. <laughs> and yourself? 45, all right, we've got 27 Twitter followers. You're gonna go to the main dish tonight. And uh, what's your Twitter handle? S H A R W W. Let's get her into the triple digits today as well. If you guys can follow uh, Can Can Sports Hall, Can Sports Hall, and let's get them to 600. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you found lots of value in it. My name is Kevin Hayes. You can find me on Twitter at Kevin Hayes C A, and uh, we'll see you at the second last Friday of next month. Thanks for coming out.